All right, everyone. Um, can you please put your devices away? And I want you guys to be listening up and paying attention to me. Um, the main thing is I notice lots of kind of people struggling with starting their questions or kind of mixing and matching things up. And I want to make sure it's really clear what you do for each question. So I would like devices away. So that way there's no distractions. I want you guys to be listening to me and not potentially on something else. You might want to have a piece of paper so you can copy down when I'm writing, but I will scan it and put it on Google Classroom. I'm just drawing some real basic things. So you guys remember what we're looking at, because I don't want potential confusion. I drew those beakers way too far away from each other. Cool. All right, so that's what we're looking at when we think about electrolytic and galvanic cells. Uh, what I want to remind you guys of is just some key differences in how to get started because a lot of you guys are mixing and matching the two, and you need to keep them as two separate units because uh, that's what they are. There are some overlap, but the overlap's really minimal because all we are talking about in this case is like overlap in a sense that they're both redox reactions uh, overlap in a sense that the cathode and the anode are still the same half reactions attached to it. Um, so if you want of a list of things that's the same, before I go on to that, things that are the same. For both cells. Uh, you would state that they're, you know, they're both redox reactions. And then the other thing is that the cathode is always going to be the reduction reaction. And the anode is always the oxidation reaction. Those are the things that are the same. Everything else is basically really, really different how you tackle these two problems. So that's why I want you guys to remember that when you're looking at it. Don't um, project things that are from one cell onto the other cell. And I saw that kind of a bit when I was marking. Are we good so far? All right, can I go back to the other page? Okay, so what we're thinking about for the first step is basically setup and how I start answering the question. Um, so that's what I want to think about is basically how do we set it up. So when you're thinking about setup, uh, for the electrolytic cell, you are going to look at what the ionic compound is. And then you're going to split it into its ions. So for example, if my ionic compound is, I'm going to put this in a different color so you know what I'm doing as an example. Uh, if it's sodium chloride, I'm going to split this into the sodium ion and the chloride ion. Cool, thanks. Does that make sense so far? Okay. Once I have that information, then I can start figuring out, okay, which one's oxidation and which one's reduction. So the other thing to remember about these electrolytic cells is that we are always going from the ion to the element. Okay? If you are going from element to ion, you are automatically wrong. The whole question's wrong. There's no way to save it. I have to give you a not achieve for that section. If you get a not achieve in one section, you get a not achieve overall. Ellen. So do both sides are always ion to element? Yes, both sides are always ion to element. But I think not. Yeah, that's why I'm separating it as two separate ideas. I don't want to mix and match them right now. Yeah. I want you guys, or do you want me to go back and forth so you can see the difference? Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, go back and forth? Okay. When it comes to the galvanic cell setup, the thing that you're going to have is you're going to have a pair. 
So you're gonna have two pairs. And of these two pairs, the pair will have um, the metal and its ion. So for example, when I say two pairs, it could be um, like the copper two plus and the copper metal. And then that's their first pair. The second pair could be, for example, um, and this is what you guys did on your practice assessment, the lead two ion and the lead. So you see how already when I look at it, the, the thing is set up differently. Are you okay so far? All right. In this case, when we're thinking about how is it going to be moving, we always have one um, that's going from the ion to the element. If it's doing ion to element, that's going to be your reduction reaction. The second one will always go from element to ion, which is going to be your oxidation reaction. If you have two going in the same direction, so you have two ions going to elements, then you have two reduction reactions. If you have two elements going to ions, then you have two oxidation reactions. And if you have two of the same reaction, you know you're wrong, because we always have to have one of each. Does that make sense so far? Are we good? Billy? How do you know which one does So that is when you use the standard reduction potential. So for this question here, you figure this out using standard reduction potential. So the one that has the higher number is the oxidation. The one that has the lower is the reduction. When you say higher, you mean like... More positive. Yeah, more positive number. If it's higher on the chart. Higher on the chart is the other way to describe it. No, no, no. Ease of reduction. Yeah, the higher it is. The, the higher easier, it is. easier it is to reduce it. Do you guys need to see um, the resource sheet? Or do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Billy, do you need to see the resource sheet? Or do you know what I mean? What was it? Standard reduction potential. This. So the higher it is on this list. Okay. Think about it logically. When you look at fluorine on the periodic table, it's a very small element. It only needs the one electron to fill its valence shell, so it's very electron negative. In the case of lithium, it's on the other side of the periodic table. It's a small atom. If it just loses that one electron, it will have a full shell. So it is going to want to get rid of that electron. So that's why it's at the bottom. All right, Billy? Got it? You okay? All right, are we good so far? All right. So this means that in the electrolytic cell, you don't need to use the standard reduction potential to decide anything. You only need to do it for the galvanic. Does that make sense? So I'm not even going to write it down on this side because I'm not even using it. And I'm just going to ignore the green. The green's only on this side. When it comes to this side of the equation then, when I'm thinking about it, let me get a different color. So the way I decide reduction and oxidation, the positive ion is going to be the one that's going to be reduced. And the negative ion oops, is going to be what is oxidized. Cool? Remember when you are doing those electrons and you're balancing those half equations, if something's being reduced, the electron should be on the reactant side. And if it's going to be oxidized, it should be on the product side. Because you have to think about if it's accepting the electrons or releasing the electrons. Billy again. Uh, no, but I can give you one if you want. It's also right there in the classroom. I can give you one if you want. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you can look at the side there. Um, so just remember that with the ions, the cation is positive. Or sorry, the metal is the positive one and the nonmetal is the negative one. But if you look at a periodic table, you can tell what group it's in, and the group can tell you if it's positive or negative and what the charge is. This is stuff that you guys learned in level one with ionic compounds. Are you okay with that so far? All right. Um, I think that's mostly it. Once you figure out that sort of stuff, you just kind of keep snowballing and continuing on with that justification.
All right. Um, the other thing I want to note as kind of being unique to this side on here is that this galvanic cell, some of you guys are running uh, standard cell diagrams. You only have standard cell diagrams in the galvanic cell. You don't have standard cell diagrams in the electrolytic cell. Is only in the galvanic. You don't need to write it for the electrolytic. But the, um, the line thing. So you always go electrode that's being oxidized to its product. You draw the two lines to represent you've now moved to the second cell. You say the copper two ion because the copper two ion is going to be reduced to form the copper electrode. This is actually not part of the assessment. You don't need to do this. This is just if you want to write it down because I can use it as extra evidence. So um, not a, not required. Elizabeth. Um, I noticed when doing um, that, that, like when both solutions are aqueous, you just do a comma. Yes, but I'm not going to give you one of those. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to keep it really, really simple. I'm going to give you an ionic compound that's molten, and I'm going to give you a pair that's metal and it's ion. So that's why I'm writing those down as the examples. I'm giving you some, I'm giving you guys the simple reactions because there's no point in me adding extra layers to the problem because it's not part of the assessment criteria in a way. It just means I'm going to trip more of you guys up, which isn't fair. Cool. All right, I think that's mostly it. The main thing then from there is just to kind of continue as you would expect. Um, make sure you are stating your observations. In this case, your observations, all you would be talking about would be the bubbles. I'll add that actually. Um, in this case, your observations are basically the bubbles and the um, metal that's formed. So the metal is because of the uh, reduction reaction, because uh, you're producing that metal ion. So say, for example, you'd be stating that it would be, you know, sodium. The bubbles would be your non-metal uh, component. So say, for example, uh, the chlorine gas that's formed. Yeah, and then you just look at the sheet and whatever the color is, that's what you use. For the observations in the galvanic cell, it's more difficult because you have more components. I need you to tell me what's happening to each electrode. Basically, is the mass increasing or decreasing? And I also needed you to tell me each solution if there's color changes. How do you know if it's increasing or decreasing? Based off of the reaction. Is the color changes on the sheet? Yes, color changes on the sheet. And the mass? The mass you would just state. So in this case, like the mass would increase <laughs> if you have the uh, reduction reaction and the mass would decrease in the re oxidation reaction. Is that what you write in the reduction reaction? Well, that's how you would identify it. So like, in the reduction reaction, we are going from ion to element. So since I'm forming the element, that's gonna increase my mass. If I'm going from element to ion, I'm losing the elemental metal to form the ion, and so the mass would decrease. Okay? And is that a question? Uh, yeah, we can just move, move it. Where do you want it? So I can see the, the bubbles thing on the bit. Yeah, that it? Thank you. All right, Ellen. Um, so you're saying that both, like, in the both beakers would change the proportion? Um, both beakers would have some change in the ions. Whether or not you would observe a color change depends on if the ion is colored or not. So if it's copper, you do see a color change because the, the copper two ion is blue. But in the, the lead two ion, you wouldn't see a color change. But you need to state you wouldn't see a color change as part of the requirements. Because you know how I want four observations? I want an observation for each electrode. I want an observation for each solution. So you'd say in this case, if we're looking at this example, the electrode for lead would decrease um, because it's being reduced. The electrode for uh, copper would increase because there's going to be more copper produced from the uh, from the reduction reaction. Color change wise, um, for the lead solution, I would see no color change because even though the lead ion is increasing, the lead two ion is colorless, so it has no effect on what I see observably. 
um, the copper two ion is decreasing. And so I would expect the solution to go um, paler blue as I'm losing the copper two ion. Does that make sense? So if, if there's no observable observation, I still need to state there's no observable observation. In this question here, you shouldn't be talking about changes in mass of electrodes. You just need to state if a metal is forming or if uh, bubbles are forming. I mean, in theory, you could state that the mass is increasing for the metal half, but it's not necessary because, yeah, I'm giving you inert electrodes anyway. Uh, Sam? Um, if a metal is forming in the galvanic cell, yep. do you say that it is like a metallic or strong? Uh, you don't really need to say, or sorry, you don't need to really say that for the galvanic cell. You just need to, like, it's implied when you say the mass is increasing, is what I want to say. Whereas in this case, you, like, it depends on the electrolytic cell. Uh, I find in the aqueous solutions, it tends to form on the electrode, but in the molten solution, they just tend to fall at the bottom. So I'm not going to be expecting you to state that the mass of the electrode is increasing or decreasing. I just need you to state that, you know, you would see a metal being formed. Cool. Does that help kind of organize it? Um, the thing that you need to be mindful of is these things are very different. So some of the feedback I might've written on your practice internal is you're confusing the two cells together and you need to separate the ideas. And that's what I was trying to do with this um, activity or these notes. Yeah, I'll scan it, I've recorded it. So you guys can watch it again if you need to. Cool. All right, hopefully that helps. Uh, the other thing I wanted to do was kind of go through what I put onto Google Classroom. Um, so I put studying material for the Redox internal, and I'm giving you guys some instructions. Um, the material. Um, so just as a reminder, everything that you need is on the Google site. I have uploaded on there. Um, the, or sorry, on the Google site, there's everything. There's all the videos that I recorded when I was teaching this material. There's scanned notes of um, everything I've written down. There's some specific ones. So I want to say it's the um, electrolysis of molten solutions and the galvanic cell, I think the, the first lesson on it. Uh, both of those have scanned PDFs of the model answer and what you need to do for achieve merit and excellence. So you guys can differentiate uh, based on what you're trying to aim for. So do look on the Google site for that information. I might actually put it on there so you guys can have an easy access to it. Um, if you want to, so the Google site has a lot, of idea, a lot of things you can do, but if you want to keep it simple and just prepare for the assessment, this is what I suggest you do. So for the electrolytic cells, pick any ion compound and, and draw its electrolysis. So any anything, you can make it up. It just needs to be something simple with monoatomic ions, nothing with polyatomic. So that's how I just picked up, you know, um, sodium chloride is an example of a monoatomic um, ion compound. So anything you want to do, I've listed out the achieve, the merit, and the excellence requirements. The main reason that people were missing out on the excellence requirement was they forgot to justify the spontaneity. Remember, I need you to link it back and say it is because it is positive. Sorry, it is because it is negative. It is not spontaneous. Yeah, Anna. Um, with that, yeah. you talking about the galvanic cell, why you chose... Yeah, I'll go through that in a moment, yeah. I don't want to... I want you to separate. Because the requirements are different for the electrolytic versus the galvanic. So this is a reminder of what we're looking for for each one. Are we okay with that? All right. Galvanic cells, what I would suggest you do. Sam, are you ready? All right. For galvanic cells, if you need to practice that, I would suggest you look at the resource sheet and you pick anything that is a metal and its ionic pair. So if I'm looking at the first one on that resource sheet, it's uh, fluorine. I wouldn't choose that one because fluorine is a gas. So I'm looking down the sheet and I can pick anything, uh, say for example, like silver and the silver on, uh, one ion. That is a metal and it's paired. So you can pick anything off that list You can and pair them together and do the analysis. Does that make sense? So you can create your own practice problems. I don't need to give them to you. Um, there's the achieve, the merit, and the excellence requirement. Uh, the achieve isn't too bad. All you need to do is identify which half reactions which. If you mistakenly get them the wrong way around, it's an automatic not achieved. Because so you need to be using the standard reduction potentials correctly. So I need you to be able to identify, for example, 
uh, with the one that you guys did yesterday, that it's the lead two ion that's, or sorry, the lead that's being oxidized and the copper two ion that's being reduced. You need to do that identification process to pass. If you get it the wrong way around, it's an automatic not achieved. Yeah. Okay. Resource sheet tells you that. You just look to see which one's higher. Yeah. Um, after you do that, all you need to do for me is define oxidation and reduction, and you're done. You don't need to do anything else. Um, just as our, so merit is fine. Excellence, or sorry, the thing that let a lot of people down was just the identifying the, four, uh, the, uh, the observations and then link them back to the species that is specifically involved for that observation. So understanding that if the color is becoming pale or blue, it's because there's a decrease in the copper two ion. That's linking it. Cool. Um, for the excellence, then, you need to get four out of four of the observations. Uh, this is what you were asking about, um, Anna. Explain how you determine the reaction, uh, which reaction was reduction, which reaction was oxidation. You just need to do one of them, and I have evidence. Uh, you just link it back to the standard reduction potential. So you state, I know that this is the reduction reaction because this is the stronger oxidant since its standard reduction potential is higher. That's all. And that was something I forgot to include when I was teaching to you guys. Okay? Basically, you've done it for the achieve, and it's needed to write down and explain it for the excellence. Because you have obviously thought that through. You just need to write it down. Cool. All right. That's everything from me. You guys have the rest of the period as a study period, unless you have any other questions. You good? Oh, I remember now. Um, the final part with the compare and contrast, a lot of you guys were asking me questions on it. Um, there's a list of things that I'm looking for, and so long as you get two out of those things, you are fine. Yeah, Billy. Can you go through Yeah, yeah, I can. So the first one is you can tell me the energy transformation and compare and contrast those two. So for example, which one is going from chemical energy to electrical energy, which is your galvanic, that's batteries, um, and which one's going from electrical energy to chemical energy. So that would be your electrolytic, because you're putting in energy to do that chemical reaction. So, and you're going to get chemical storage of energy there. So that's the first thing you could write about. The second thing you could write about is the experimental setup with all the details. So I don't want just the number of cells. I want you to go through it in more detail in a sense of number of cells, which one has the ion, uh, ion bridge, uh, the number of solutions slash molten ions. Um, so basically with the electrolytic cell, because you only have one beaker, there's only one solution slash molten ion. In the galvanic cell, because you have two beakers, there's two solutions. Cool. Okay, what's the other thing you said first? Uh, it's all in Google Classroom. The first thing I said was energy transformation. So stating what energy form are you starting with and what energy form is it creating. Sorry. So thinking about chemical and electrical energy. Um, other things are the spontaneity with linkage to the E cell sign. So just stating whether or not the reaction is spontaneous or not, uh, and relating that into the E cell. So is the E cell positive or negative for that spontaneity? And then the fourth thing I need is the anode and cathode comparison. Uh, so basically which half reactions occur at which location. So cathodes always reduction, anodes always oxidation. However, depending on what type of cell we are talking about, the charge changes. So which shell is going to be positive, which is going to be the negative. Cool. So there's four things that you can write about. I need to have two of them written well. Most of you guys got this, though. It's pretty logical and self-explanatory. Just compare and contrast. Um, this part here, you only need to do if you're aiming for the excellence, because there's no merit points and there's no achieve points there. But I can use that as evidence if you've made a mistake somewhere else. Billy? Sorry, when you said number of cells. So basically number of beakers. Oh, right. Yeah. Cool. All right, that's all in Google Classroom. I will scan this sheet here. Um, I might add a little extra note on there to remind you guys so you don't get confused. Here we go. Uh, this one here, I'm always going to give you molten. Let me find a different color that I haven't used yet. Here we go. So this in here is going to be molten to make your life a lot easier because then you don't have to factor in water. 
these in here are always going to be solutions. So with the electrolytic cell, if you guys remember, we split two lessons. We did one lesson on if it was molten, and we did one lesson on if it was a solution. So in theory, this can be molten or a solution. On the assessment, I'm only going to give you molten because it simplifies the question. So molten just means that the ionic compound is melted and there's no water. So this is a liquid. The solution in this case, it means it's aqueous. So I've dissolved the ionic compound into water. Does that make more sense, Billy? Yeah. Okay, so hopefully that's organized your thoughts. Or Any other questions? Are you guys okay? Is that always important? Yeah, you can talk about that as another comparison factor. It's not something that I need, but you can write that. Okay. Yeah. In the electrolytic cell, be mindful that you can have an aqueous solution. Um, it's just in the question I give you, it's not going to be aqueous. Cool. All right. You guys have the rest of the period to study. <laughs>